um, I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves around the table, but I first wanted to check we have a couple of members that I believe are participating via telephone. Jim Newsom, um, former CFTC chairman and CME board member. Jim, are you on the phone? I am on the phone, Commissioner. Great. Thank you, Jim. And Mike Dolly, um, who's chairman of the FIA, I believe was also going to participate via telephone. Mike, are you there? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, and we are supposed to have um, Roger Liddell via video conference for this part of the meeting as well. So hopefully that will be hooked up shortly. So I'll start with Eric, if you'd like to go around the table. and. Uh, hi, good interested. afternoon. Can I can hear you and see you, but I don't know if you can hear or oh, see okay. me, Great. Roger. Roger, thank you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Eric Vinson, I'm president of Osprey Management and board member of the Managed Funds Association. My name is Thomas Callahan. I'm executive vice president of NYC Euronext and CEO of NYC Life US, the US derivative exchange of NYC Euronext. Good afternoon. My name is Jiro Kochi. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Revel. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Klein. I'm a managing director and counsel at Citigroup. I'm Joanne Madero. I'm managing director of uh, BlackRock. George Crapple, uh, co-chairman and uh, co-CEO of Milburn Ridgefield. We're a CTA and CPO. I'm also on the board of the FIA and the NFA. Uh, my name is Ronald Filler. I'm a professor of law now and director of the Center on Financial Services Law at New York Law School. I'm Jason, Jackie Mesa, uh, the director of international affairs at the CFTC. Bob Wasserman, associate director and DCIO here at CFTC. My name is David Wright. I'm the deputy director general in the European Commission uh, dealing with uh, financial markets. I'm Dave Danilek, treasurer of the Boeing Company. Bonnie Litt, I'm a managing director and associate general counsel at Goldman Sachs, and I'm also president of the uh, long executive committee of the Law and Compliance Division of FIA. Uh, I'm Dan Roth from National Futures <coughs> Association. I'm Donald Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of DRW Trading, which is a proprietary trading group. Uh, we focus on providing liquidity in exchange traded markets. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started with the first part of our meeting, um, which is uh, having Jackie give us a update on IOSCO issues. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Chairman Summers. I was hoping that maybe you just ate right through my time and I would just sit <laughs> here and uh, pleasantly smile at everyone. But seeing that uh, you're still going to want me to go forward, I wanted to provide today an update on IOSCO issues. and. Um, IOSCO has been very busy in the last year, as you can imagine, so I won't go through everything they're working on, but sort of what they've been doing post-crisis. The, In response to the G20 call for action, IOSCO formed three task forces, one on unregulated markets and products, one on unregulated entities, and one on short selling. The CFTC participated in two of those, unregulated markets and products and the task force on unregulated entities. Both task force have released final reports adopted by IOSCO. In the unregulated markets and products report, it focused on two instruments that were viewed to be at the core of the crisis, collateralized debt ob obligations and credit default swaps. On CDOs, IOSCO felt that because CDOs contained such complex leverage that even accredited investors sometimes had difficulty understanding the risk, IOSCO recommended several things. One, to improve disclosure. Two, encourage members to reconsider the standard of sophisticated or accredited investor. And finally, ask regulators to examine incentives, and that's typically known as the skin in the game requirement. Regarding CDS, IOSCO encouraged standardization of products. For those that were standardized, encourage clearing and exchange trading of those CDSs, and recommended that counterparties have appropriate capital and margining for non-standardized products. As you can see, I think the U.S. and EU and other countries have moved generally in that direction, which was the agreement of regulators very early on right after the crisis. Currently, both of the, these task forces are considering monitoring the implementation of the recommendations and are considering, particularly with the um, unregulated markets and products, if this can be expanded to all OTC products. 
On unregulated entities, in June 2009, the TC endorsed and published a report and recommended six principles for hedge fund regulation. One, that hedge fund managers should be subject to mandatory registration. Two, that hedge fund managers, are, which are required to be registered, should be subject to appropriate ongoing regulatory requirements. And there are a number of details which I won't go through there. That they should prime brokers and banks providing funding to hedge funds should be subject to mandatory registration and regulation and a public oversight system and have in place appropriate risk management systems and controls. That hedge fund managers, advisors, and prime brokers should provide to the relevant reg regulator information for systemic risk purposes. This is the area that IOSCO is working on now and trying to go forward on a united front on what information they're going to collect from hedge funds. Five, that regulators should encourage and take account of the development, implementation, and convergence of industry good practices where appropriate. And six, that regulators should have the authority to cooperate and share information. IOSCO is also updating its 30 principles for regulation for securities and futures regulator regulators and is going to adopt at least three new principles. One on systemic risk, second on the perimeter of regulation, and third for credit rating agencies, auditors, and other quote unquote information providers. There are also separate standards for clearing and settlement systems, the IOSCO CPSS standards. These are also going to be under significant review. Right now IOSCO is reviewing these standards to update for OTC clearing but during this update discovered that there are a number of areas that needed um, significant review and update and have agreed to go forward and revise those principles. I'm, I'm going to address a couple of more areas IOSCO is looking at. One is direct electronic access and the reason I'm pointing this out is because this was the subject of the last GMAC meeting where we had significant <coughs> discussion. IOSCO did put out a report in this area for um, consultation and one of the primary recommendations was that markets should not offer direct electronic access unless they can ensure automatic pre-trade controls that allow the responsible firm the ability to limit the market member's exposure. Although a majority of commentators supported the proposed principles, some objected to mandating the use of automated risk limits controls as an infringement on their activities. The standing committees are still looking at comments and deciding what is appropriate given the high-speed algorithmic trading that occurs today and making sure that regulators are up to date and in their rules and regulations. And finally, the last point I'm going to talk about is the Commodity Futures Markets Task Force, and it's a, um, the subject that Commissioner Don highlighted in his opening remarks. This was a call by the G20 to specifically look at oil markets and how um, regulators can handle the volatility over the last couple of years in the oil markets. Specifically, they asked for us to look at large concentrations um, and to look at on exchange and over the counter. We met just Monday in London, so sorry if I look a little tired. I just flew back, <laughs> as some of you flew here today as well. Um, and what it was, it was a very good meeting, and there was substantial progress made <coughs> during the meeting on Monday. Regulators are seriously going to take steps to um, look at oil trading and over-the-counter markets to actually aggregate that data and put it forward for the public and to make sure that they are properly looking for manipulation and other abuses in the oil markets. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Does anyone have any particular <coughs> questions on the IOSCO? projects that are ongoing. If not, we're going to move on to uh, the first part of our meeting, and we are honored to have Ron Filler, who is a longtime member of GMAC, back with us today. Thank you for being here, Ron, to participate in this. He's uh, going to give us an overview of the bankruptcy issues associated with uh, Lehman Brothers um, bankruptcy that happened last year. Thank you, Commissioner Summers. Uh, as I mentioned, I am now a professor of law, but I think the reason I was asked to come here is before joining the uh, faculty at the law school, I was a managing director in the Capital Markets Prime Service Division at Lehman Brothers for over 15 years, where my responsibilities included a variety of business and legal issues affecting Lehman's global futures business. So. I hope to use those perspectives, and during my 30-plus years in this industry, I've had the opportunity and privilege of serving on a number of governmental, exchange, industry, and clearinghouse boards and advisory committees. And I want to thank Commissioner Summers 
for using this form to bring this issue to this discussion. This issue goes to the very heart and purpose of our industry, and that's the providing soundness and safety to customers who trade not only futures, but this issue also has got to be addressed by this agency, and as Commissioner Summers mentioned, by global regulators, as you tackle concepts like portfolio margin. I uh, deal with the OTC clearing issues. When you deal with the concept of segregation and the role that segregation should or may play in connection with these and other concepts. So it's a very important issue, and it's a global issue. And the task before this committee uh, is a very challenging one because of the global issues and the differences in the bankruptcy laws that exist around the world. Um, so let's go back um, to September the 15th, 2008, a little over 15 months ago. Seems like a lifetime. But on Monday morning, September the 15th, 2008, as you may remember, and I have a paper for you that has a lot of the facts in it, Lehman Brothers Holdings, the uh, parent holding company of Lehman and of all of its affiliates, files for bankruptcy. And many of the Lehman subsidiaries around the world also file for bankruptcy that same morning. Lehman Brothers Inc., the regulated broker dealer and FCM, does not file for bankruptcy. It still has the necessary capital to play the game, although by the end of that week, on September the 19th, it, that entity, the LBI, also files for bankruptcy. And while Lehman has, I think when we filed our org chart, uh, listing all the different maps, the material affiliated persons, probably a chart of some 200 different companies, I want to focus just on those Lehman entities that held or dealt with uh, futures clients. So you have LBI here, Lehman Brothers Inc. in the U.S. Um, you have Lehman Brothers International Europe or LBIE or Lehman London. You have Lehman Brothers Japan, which was the clearing member of the three exchanges in Tokyo. You had Lehman Brothers Futures Asia Limited, or which was a clearing arm in Hong Kong. And you had Lehman Brothers PTE, which was the clearing firm on the uh, SGX exchange in Singapore. And the way the Lehman system was structured from a futures perspective, LBI, only LBI and LBIE held client accounts. LBI probably had about 65% of the business, and LBIE had about 35% of the business. And also what's important in this, thinking about the structure and the issues that we're about to talk about, LBI would then have a customer omnibus account with each of the other Lehman affiliates around the world that acted as their respective clearing member on those clearing houses. And to the extent Lehman did not have a clearing membership on some of the exchanges, uh, where we use a third party clearing firm, LBI would have the customer omnibus account with those third party firms. So LBIE was the clearing arm for Europe. LBI was the clearing arm for the U.S. and had the relationships with all of the other Lehman affiliates, primarily in Asia. So when Lehman Brothers uh, Holdings file for bankruptcy, and if you also got to remember, Monday, September the 15th, the markets were extremely volatile that day. So I think it's best in looking at the picture and to try to figure out what issues, what reforms, what concepts need to be addressed. I like to separate what happened here in the U.S., and then look what happened outside the U.S. for discussion purposes. In the U.S., I think with, with the exception of one small glitch, which we're going to talk about, it, the system worked pretty well. Monday morning, and Lima's client business was strictly institutional, probably some of the premier mutual funds, pension plans, state retirement plans, uh, money managers, hedge funds, corporations, and governments. I mean, we really had, uh, I considered a premier list of institutional clients. Many of them had multiple clearing relationships. So they would be not only using Lehman as their clearing firm, but they would have clearing relationships with other clearing firms on the street. And those firms that had clearing relationships with those clients that had accounts with us that also had an account at another firm Obviously, with the news breaking that morning, they started sending us what we call a, in the industry, an expat transfer letter requesting that their open positions be transferred off the books of Lehman, LBI, 
to the other clearing firms. And as, as in the course of that week, that's what happened. Uh, Monday night, the positions that we got letters for were moved to other firms. Uh, Tuesday morning, that happens after the close of business on Monday. Tuesday morning, we all come in and the positions were closed out and therefore no open positions remain on the books of Lehman for that account. We then transfer the assets that we use for margin, cash and collateral, to the clearing member that received those positions uh, on the close of business that night. Uh, Tuesday, night, Tuesday during the day, same thing happened. We got another lot of requests. Um, and Wednesday morning, we transfer the funds. Wednesday night, we had Wednesday during the day, we got more requests. Everything was working smoothly until Thursday. And that's the one glitch that, to be honest, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I know it's an answer or an issue that maybe the commission is looking at. But our custodial bank, J.P. Morgan Chase, for whatever reason, and I have never seen the reason behind it, froze the assets that were held in the custodial segregated account. And so while all the positions got moved that week and the monies had been flowing out in a very smooth way, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and so forth, on Thursday those assets were frozen. But through the great efforts of the commission staff and others in the industry, uh, about, was it eight or ten days later, uh, J.P. Morgan eventually did move the position, the cash and collateral that we held uh, with that bank over to the respective clearing firms that receive it. So addressing the U.S. approach, I would say the systems work. The, the laws dealing with segregation, the reg regulations dealing with segregation under 1.20, it worked for the most part and very successful. And by the close of business on Friday, September the 19th, uh, if you recall, after the close of business that day, those clients who did not have a clearing account at another firm, all of their positions were moved to Barclays Capital, which bought all of the client assets and accounts at Lehman after the close of business on that Friday. So by the close of business of that week, the great news is all the positions and eventually all of the monies flowed over to the customers and clearing firms, I should say, uh, where the customers now had accounts. So the system works here, and it worked pretty well. Now let's turn our attention. Could, could I just out. could I just ask one quick question? Sure. What portion moved uh, during the week versus the Barclays uh, port portability at the end of the uh, week? You mean the last part of the yeah, piece? Yeah. I mean, did you know? It, 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 the answer. Chairman Gensler, is there was just those client accounts that did not have a multiple clearing relationship. I don't know the exact number, but I'd probably say it's about 25, 30 percent. Maybe wrong in that number is a guess on my right. part. So the vast or the majority, maybe 70, 75 percent, had moved already. Correct. And then 20 This was just, and it was impossible for those firms or clients to open up an account that quickly that week with all the things going on. And with Barclays acquiring all of the accounts that still remain on the books of Lehman that day, the good news is all the client positions got moved healthily. Right. And the, uh, just to clarify, this is all just futures. It's not what happened with prime I'm brokerage a or, or swaps. <laughs> I'm a futures guy. <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right. So, all right. Thanks. No, the swap world we're still dealing with. Um, and, and it's interesting what you raise because the equity world is slightly different than the futures. And, you know, a lot of people will say, boy, it took five days to move those futures positions. To me, that's a good thing. Some people say it should have been done in one day or two days or three days. But when you compare the futures regime to even the equity regime, it's a much better regime to facilitate transfers of both positions and collateral to another firm. Outside the U.S., we got a bigger issue. And that issue... I think if you talked to any lawyer in this room prior to September the 15th, you would have gotten a different answer to the question I'm about to raise or the issue than what we now know. And what we've learned post Lehman is that the bankruptcy laws trump all the regulations that we have in place to protect customers. And the bankruptcy laws in London and Japan and Hong Kong preempted all of the rules and regulations and pr customer protections that we thought were in place um, within the connection with both not only LBI, but LBIE clients as well. 
London, as you know, or UK has a client money rule regime, which is very similar to the segregation rule here. Uh, there are some subtle issues dealing with what happened in London, but the concepts of customer protections are quite similar between London um, and the U.S., but the bankruptcy laws differ significantly outside the U.S. versus what we have here. And if you think about it, one of the more forward-thinking concepts that we have here in the U.S. regarding bankruptcy laws, we have specific provisions under the U.S. Bankruptcy Code that deals with the bankruptcy of a securities firm called SIPI. We have a different set of provisions dealing with the bankruptcy of a commodity firm, and it's called segregation, and the rules and specific behind provisions, I should say, under the bankruptcy code, all of which are designed to protect the client assets against the claims of creditors of the bankrupt firm. So our regime is pretty good. But now that you're considering portfolio margining, you're considering OTC clearing, there is no concepts of swap dealers in those codes. There is no, con and the issue that we deal with in the U.S., and it varies even between securities and futures, is a concept called specifically identifiable property. How do you treat assets of a bankrupt estate that belong to a particular individual versus cash? And with futures margin and with OTC clearing, with cash being a principal player, you got to be very careful and you got to address these issues just to make sure customer assets are protected down the road. Now let's go across the, the ocean. Monday morning, as I said, all four of these Lehman affiliates as well as many others file for bankruptcy in their respective countries. So I'm going to focus mainly on LBIE, meaning Lehman London, but the issues that happen in London also exists as we speak in Japan and Hong Kong, Singapore, and everywhere else. Monday morning, the UK government appoints, as you know, Price Waterhouse Cooper as the administrator. And the administrator is very similar to the concept of bankruptcy, a trustee in bankruptcy that we have here. And, and PwC to, um, comes in Monday and really doesn't allow any transactions transfers, or even positions, liquidations to occur. Tuesday, they do not allow any transfers or position liquidations to occur. By Wednesday afternoon, through a lot of pressure through put on by the PwC through a lot of other entities, they finally allowed positions to either be liquidated or transfers to other firms. Now, I want to give some special credit right now to, to LCH ClearNet. I know Roger is going to be you know, talking in a second. I want to give special credit to Andreas Preuss at Eurex Clearing. Those two clearinghouses stepped up to the plate and really helped what happened on Thursday and Friday of that week. On Thursday and Friday, every customer position held at LBIE got transferred to other firms. I mean, to me, in a two-day period, it was a miraculous transfer, but by the close of business on Friday, September the 19th, no Lehman entity held any customer position. That's the great news. The bad news is not one dollar has been transferred out of the bankruptcy estate in the past 15 months. Margin, as we all know, are used to provide risk protections to the clearing firms. And when the positions are liquidated or transferred and there's no longer a need for margin, there's no longer a need for the clearing member to hold that cash or collateral for margin. By September the 19th, with all of the positions around the world transferred out, there's no longer a need for the margins to be held by any of the bankrupt estates, but because outside the U.S., in at same pot that the futures margin was held, you have securities margin, you have OTC swap margin or, or cash or collateral, and when you have the one pot approach issue, they're not going to allow the monies that are held to, that were strictly for futures to be released until they resolve the entire pot. And that's one of the issues that I hope that this committee and the commission through OSCO, IOSCO or whatever, how do we address the bankruptcy provisions globally? 
bring them up to some level where clients of a bankrupt estate do receive the necessary protections, and not only to protection of the assets, but the rights to get the assets distributed if the risks are no longer associated. The products are no longer on the books of the bankrupt estate and no longer the need for margin. How do we get margins or cash, client cash or collateral transferred out of the estate and back into the um, hands of the customers or their new clearing firms? So it, it was a lesson that I think was learned post Lehman. I, I think if you asked me that question before September the 15th, I would have said, of course the margins would have been transferred out, but I was wrong. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I clearly know a lot less about this subject than you do. <laughs> um, but I didn't follow. Your U.S. company, by Friday, everything had been moved out. And I thought you were saying is the London company, uh, this LBIE, though it was a different process by that Friday, also everything, because you gave a compliment to Roger P and Andre. Positions were moved, but not the underlying cash or collateral that was used to margin those positions. Oh, I see. So it's the, the margin, the margin, client assets. the margin that was there in September of 2008. Still sits there today. Still sits there. The counterparty might have had the trade move, but they correct, they, and then, so then they had to have a lot of lawyers chase after the margin. Well, if you think about it, the client base were a lot of large U.S. mutual funds and pension plans who had a a global trading strategy. Maybe they were trading equities globally, and they used the stock index futures outside the U.S. as a hedge. Um, those I, positions. I think I understand that. So, so in the U.S., the position and the margin moved correct by Friday. Well, there the was margin a with a little bit of a glitch, but There's yes. It was a glitch, but by Friday it moved, right? That J.P. Morgan Well, glitched. it was about a week later the margin right, got, right. but it got moved. But in the Europe, the positions were moved, but not the margin. Correct. A couple it. exchanges Thanks. around the world chose not to allow the transfers. They were smaller amounts. They were not significant to um, uh, our client base, but a couple smaller exchanges chose to liquidate and not allow the transfers to occur. So that, those were probably the exceptions on the positions, the open positions. But as you're going to hear probably today from other speakers, the issues outside the U.S. are not just future-centric. It's, it's because of the one-pot approach for all products. You have that issue that needs to be addressed and try to figure out what reforms, either legislative or regulatory, uh, are needed to provide greater protections to customers because it is a global market. Ron, in the jurisdictions where uh, positions were liquidated, what happened to the release of margin in connection with those positions? Uh, no difference. No difference. No, so it was because all held it was. Up. Yeah. Um, those are both European exchanges, Bonnie, mm -hmm. and LBIE had a um, customer omnibus account. Right. And they've still, to my knowledge, they're still holding them. And they may have been returned to PwC. I don't know the answer to that to your question. Same thing happened with LCH and UREC. We had a lot of client margins, to obviously, the place with the clearinghouses to clear those positions. I really haven't stayed with the issue of what happened. Did PwC collect those assets and still holding those assets? The one thing I have heard, and I, I'm, again, I was, by the way, I was not at Lehman at the time. They invited me back that week to come help. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make that straight. I was. I was in academia land, and it's, by the way, ac academic land is great. Um, <laughs> I haven't followed what happened to the monies, what happened with the PwC. So at LCH, they had a bunch of client assets because Lehman was clearing. When the positions got moved, did they give it to PwC? And the one thing I have heard, and I, don't, I can't verify this, is that the assets around the world are still protected, still being held. It just haven't been released. So that's the key part of the issue. Actually, Roger. Hey, Ron, leave. this is Jim Newsom. Okay. Uh, one question. O on the exchanges that forced liquidation, how quick was the liquidation period and how damaging that was that to the uh, customers? Uh, thank you, Jim. I think they happened on that Wednesday of that week. I mean, I was, on, I was brought back, as I mentioned, I was on the phone call with those officials at those exchanges, pleading with them from a public interest, public policy perspective that it's not in your interest to liquidate, it's in your interest. And we had a home for those. 
So why not transfer them, let's say, to a Goldman Sachs that night? Uh, they're no longer on the books of LBIE. They'll be on the books of Goldman Sachs at that particular exchange. But they just chose to liquidate. Now, the good news is it was a very small portion of the total pot. Eric, do you have Ron, a question? Sorry. When, when the LBIE positions moved without the money, did the new clearing firms require the margin to be deposited before they would accept? No, I think, well, as in any tr expat transfer, you take the positions and expect the margins to come the next day. Given the fact that a lot of the clients were you know, very premier U.S. clients, what happened to those? Those clients had to put up extra margin at the new clearing firms just to margin these positions that came on that Thursday and Friday of that week. Ron, um, I assume there have been bankruptcies before Lehman of other broker-dealers in the U.K., whether it's Barings or I don't know of any others. But um, why do you think um, the um, there was a lack of clarity in this case? Was it something unique to this situation? Or was it, I mean, do you think there was a lack of, of diligence on the part of various market participants about how this regime worked? Sorry, thank you, George. <laughs> I, I, it's, it's, I don't have the exact answer to your question. And I think you have to look at Lehman, and you also have to look at the UK bankruptcy laws. They have a unique approach um, to much different than what we have here in the U.S. Their approach is if you're the administrator, PwC, and you release the funds, and as it turns out, those, that transfer or distribution of those funds turns out to be an incorrect one, you're personally liable. And they are fighting, as you may know, or trying to wrestle with the courts over there to allow a lot of the assets to be distributed and to date, the courts have not authorized those transfers, and there's a quirk over there in their UK bankruptcy laws that, to me, needs to be addressed and, and fixed. Um, we don't have that issue here, but it does exist there.